Hello and welcome to this episode of the Her Success Podcast. We are the podcast that interviews highly successful and influential females within engineering and technology with the hope of inspiring the next generation of leaders in this space. This podcast is brought to you by Entau. Entau is a leading technology and engineering recruitment firm that really cares about DEI, so much so that we donate $1,000 from every diverse placement we make to our very own nonprofit. If you're an engineer looking for your next position or you're a company looking to partner with a recruitment firm that cares about DEI, please get in contact. This week, I am joined by Leslie Bondarek. Um, Leslie is an MIT grad, and she's the CEO of the Concord Consortium, a nonprofit educational research and development organization. Leslie is an expert in education. She's worked in it throughout her career. And on this episode, we explore how we can make science and engineering more exciting and accessible to children at an early age. It's a bit of a different episode than our previous ones. It's more focused on inspiring children rather than adults and improving how our kids learn in the science and engineering fields. It's a very, very interesting episode. We explore topics that we've not covered previously and I hope you guys enjoy. So let's get to the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Her Success Podcast. Um, Today, I'm joined by Leslie Bondarek, um, who is the CTO of a really exciting company called the Concord um, Consortium. Um, Very um, excited to chat with Leslie today. She has a super varied background, and the organization she works for, I think, really jives with our mission here at Her Success. I think it's going to be a great conversation. So, Leslie, thank you for agreeing to be on the show. And, and welcome. Thanks. Great to be here, Chris. Excellent. First things first, I'd love to just get an overview of your background. I know you are you're an engineer by trade and, and obviously graduated from, from MIT in electrical engineering. Give us an overview of your maybe starting from there and, and what your background has, has kind of looked like since then. Sure. Um, and I, I've been in and out of education really like pretty much since I was in high school, actually. Um, STEM teaching has always been a big a big deal and a big motivator for me. Uh, so, you know, I used to tutor in high school. I definitely taught classes in college and in graduate school. Um, I was a TA. Uh, and from there went on to a whole series of companies that have done educational software or have done training materials for professional engineers, things like that, MathSoft, PTC. I did a stint at a publisher called PWS Publishing, which is now part of Thompson Publishing. I worked at Pearson for quite a number of years. And now I'm at the consortium where we're a sort of a think tank. Um, We do almost entirely research funded application programs for National Science Foundation, things like that, strictly on the topic of how to apply technology to STEM learning for, for kids. Oh, awesome. That educational piece, so that the, the learning, particularly in the sort of STEM and engine, engineering world, is really clear in, in your background. What, what do you think ignited that passion? Like, where does that passion for the STEM education piece come from? Yeah, well, I think that it's common, uh, a common experience for people who are in the engineering professions, the STEM professions, to often feel like often feel like it isn't taught well, right? Mm -hmm. Those of us who are in this field, you know, have a passion for it somewhere. Somebody along the line, you know, said something that seemed really cool and we went after it, or maybe we started experimenting on our own. My parents certainly bought me lots of kits and, you know, Mm -hmm. chemistry kits and microscopes and things like that, right? So I was encouraged. But there's a difference between that and being able to to formalize it. And often that's just not taught particularly well. It's it's common, I think, for folks who are in this field to feel like if only there was a better way, if only there was a, a way to reach more people, make this seem more exciting, make it make it clear, make it easier, that it's not it's not just folks who love to do algebra who can be good at these professions and find satisfaction in them. 
Yeah, it's interesting because I, I hated science and engineering in, in school. And I, I think not to uh, you know, be overly critical of, of any of my teachers, but I just remember it being so, so boring. And yeah, I've ended up in the, the engineering and tech world myself, uh, maybe slightly in- indirectly, you know, I'm not an engineer. But now I look at it and it, it's just so exciting. And like, I very much wish that I'd learned a bit more about this in my earlier years because it may have changed the path that I, I went down. In your opinion, how could we make STEM either more exciting or more accessible for people at an, an earlier age? So there's a lot of there's a lot of research work and I think yeah, anecdotal work too that's been done about getting kids to do hands-on science earlier. It's very, very important that they that they experience for themselves how to take a measurement, um, that things don't always work out and that that's okay, you know, that they actually experiment just like babies do with things like gravity, with things like mm-hmm. speed and pressure and electricity. And you absolutely can make these kinds of experiments accessible to kids, even at a very young age. We have some very interesting work that was done at Concord with kindergartners, trying to teach them about heat transfer, where they actually had a cup of cold water and a cup of hot water, and you could stick measurement, live measurement probes in there. And then we had a piece of software that would let them visualize what was happening with the molecules in real time, responding to the sensors. And then they pour the hot water into the cold water and the sensor shows all the molecules speeding up, bouncing around, getting more air between them, right? And and shows them the temperature measurement. And it's designing that kind of thing where the kid has the opportunity to really get their hands on something to experience a phenomenon that they know, like five-year-olds know about hot and cold, but to link that then to an explanation that they might have to go, huh, I never really thought about it that way. And as long as you use the right words, age-appropriate words, the right metaphors, they can get a a lot out of that kind of work. And it's not impossible. You just have to think about it a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess the practical application must be so important. You know, if I think of myself and some of the young kids that I interact with, that uh, being able to get your hands on it and to see it visually, it m- must make it so much more comprehensible for uh, certainly people of, of that age. Tell me a little bit about the Concord Consortium, a little bit about the organization, where they came from, what their mission is and, and what they do. Sure. The con- the consortium is over 25 years old. I haven't been there anywhere near that long. It was originally founded by a guy named Bob Tinker. And his mission was to bring experimental sensor work into the classroom for all the same reasons that I just talked about. It's very, very important for getting kids excited about science, for them to be able to get their hands on things and understand how scientists go about their job. How do you validate things for yourself? How do you measure things? And at the time that he was doing his work, it was when the desktop computers first came out. And so suddenly there was a device that you could reasonably have in a classroom in school. It wasn't so expensive that you couldn't afford it. It was relatively portable. I mean, it's funny mm-hmm. when we think about what was Today, portable then as opposed to yeah. portable. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, relatively portable, you could picture every science classroom having one. There started to be companies that actually made kits, and they're still around today, that will sell you a temperature sensor, sell you a humidity sensor, and so on. And he said, look, it's not that the tools aren't there, it's that the strategy isn't there. And so he started applying for grants and gathering to around himself a, a cohort of people who could figure out how to make this stuff accessible to teachers so that they could make it accessible to students. Excellent. I mean, that's really inspirational work. And and do you, how does the actual kind of mechanisms work? Do you partner with schools and consult them on how to to make that stuff more accessible? Yeah, Yeah. I mean, we're not consultants per se. We're researchers. And the way that the, the way that funding agencies typically work is that they are interested in funding programs that have a chance of having impact. So most of the research 
groups that we put together will have ourselves, possibly one or two other institutions. Uh, there's a big group of people who research education at Michigan State University, for example, uh, and another group uh, in, in at Berkeley, um, in California. Uh, and then you need to partner with schools who are going to actually instrument the things that you come up with. So we'll we'll typically recruit anywhere between five and 20 schools with teachers who are sympathetic and are willing to figure out how to work this stuff into their curriculum. And they'll work with us on what they consider to be accessible to their students and what will fit within their curriculum. Another big problem that th this kind of work faces is that schools have very set curricula grade by grade about what you're supposed to teach, what kinds of skills the kids are supposed to come out with. And so sometimes these little research nuggets inserted in, inside don't precisely fit with that. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, we need to to work with the school and with the teacher to make sure that we're we're giving them something that they have time and makes sense for them to implement. So we'll put those groups of, of folks together. We'll write the proposals together and get funded and out it goes. Once the work is done, we have on our website, we have quite a number of released projects. Often we will find that the same teachers who helped us do the research in the first place and made their classrooms and their students accessible to us will go out and proselytize and they'll tell people to, you know, come to the website, come and set up their own classes with the released work. And it, it sort of grows organically from there. Yeah. But that's uh, why that's all of this stuff we publish on our site is free because we want people to use it. We, we want people to come in and make classes and use our, use our sims and use our tools. Very cool. If you were to give advice to uh, a teacher or even a parent, you know, someone that has young kids and, you know, they they want to get them, um, you know, kind of excited about, um, you know, science and, and technology. And what advice would you give them? Take them to the science museum. <laughs> <laughs> It's, you know, take them, take them out, let them explore nature, let them explore their world, encourage them in the things that they find interesting. And the other thing that's important is that the parents shouldn't be afraid to not know themselves. I think I was lucky. My dad was a computer scientist and, okay. uh, and, a, and so it was easy for him to say, yeah, sure. Oh, you want to know more about computers? You want to know more about how wiring works? Fine. But it's perfectly okay for the adult not to know too. And then you can learn together. That's actually incredibly powerful for kids to see that adults can be wrong and fail and try and learn and grow and, and eventually succeed. You know, it's it's fine to do it together like that. Yeah, excellent. No, that, that's a, a really, really good point. I hear that a lot, almost from a different lens, but we talk about strong leadership and strong management in the work world a lot. And I think that's some of the feedback that I often get is saying, I don't know, that's not my area of expertise, let me try and find out, is often a strength and a sign of confident leadership. I imagine it's very similar, you know, as, as a parent as well. And I, I don't have kids yet, but sitting down and, and you know, saying, I don't know this, Let, let's learn this together, I imagine would be yeah, really, really impactful. We interrupt this podcast for a quick 30-second introduction to Engtel, the host of Her Success. Engtel is a U.S.-based staffing agency specializing in engineering and technology. We have an insatiable passion for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and part of our mission is to balance the diversity scales in our industry. We are so tied to this mission that we donate $1,000 from every diverse placement made for our very own nonprofit, Diversify the Future. We then use that money to fund scholarships for underrepresented groups of people to help them obtain a STEM degree. If you're an engineer or a tech professional looking for a new position, or maybe you're hiring for talent in this space and want a recruitment partner, please get in touch. Talk about some of the, or one or two of the projects um, that um, you've worked on. You mentioned one earlier with the temperature gauges. What's another example of a, a good project um, you know, that you guys have put together? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we've we done literally hundreds and hundreds of these projects over the years. Some of the stuff that I'm most excited about working on right now is the stuff that goes into minority and 
I'll say minority communities, because honestly, these days, helping women get into STEM is kind of last year's news. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, right, now we're trying to go further than that. The two that, that I'm involved in, one is called Bio for Community, uh, and it's in partnership with an interesting set of groups down at Rutgers and another one at North Carolina. Um, and the idea is to go into communities that are typically underrepresented by students interested in STEM and talk to a cohort of kids in the classroom about what they would like to learn. And again, that sounds like the kind of thing that's impossible, but it totally isn't. You can say, yeah, what would you like to learn about biology, about your biology? And they're not going to say, I want to know all about how you know cells work, but they are going to say, I'd like to understand stress response. There's a lot of stress in my community and people have different ways of dealing with it. And I want to know how that impacts me. How does that affect me biologically? Great. Totally wonderful topic. We can then develop a curriculum about that. And the curriculum is very non-traditional in the same way that it's important to give students hands-on experience. It's also incredibly important for them to feel like it is relevant to them and their lives. So, you know, they they brought storytellers in, not just scientists and not just technologists, but people who were who were good at crafting, you know, tales about how the macro effects were impacting the community. And then from there, we were able to descend down all the way down to the cellular and DNA of the biology to talk about how stress affects you can talk about cardiovascular disease and, and getting sick more often than you should and other kinds of impacts. But these things have a, have a source inside of you. And, you know, you're able to actually elucidate and talk about all of this really incredibly complex biology. This is stuff that's typically only taught at the college level. And they're very successful in communicating it to middle school students. So, that's that's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in working on. We have another project that is for the Native Alaskan communities, uh, and they have a very different kind of problem, which is that, you know, the elders in particular, and therefore the students who are from the tribes, feel like the Native way of observing their physical world is not respected in the Western view of science. And so there the challenge is to do the kinds of simulations and experimental work that we like to bring to classrooms. For example, you know, how do we observe the stars and the seasons and time of day and things like that, right? Why does it get cold in the winter? Why are the days so short? How do we give them a laboratory, in this case virtual, where they can experiment with all of that stuff, but which also at the same time acknowledges the native point of view uh, in terms mm -hmm. of how the measurements are done, how the constellations are observed. We actually have switches in, in the simulator that allow them to get the UPIC pronunciation of all of the things that are in there. And of course, there's also a curriculum that goes side by side, right? So we're partnering with those native tribal elders and, and the teachers in that community to try to bring to them an experience that, that makes it okay. Like everybody's okay. Everybody has their own stuff that they're going to bring to the knowledge of the universe and mm -hmm. how do we how do we validate that right how do we find ways to validate that and then at the same time move the knowledge bar along mm -hmm. so that's just a couple of examples of the sorts of things that we're working on today that i'm really excited about nice yeah it sounds awesome my brother's a, a teacher but back in the uk and he said something similar. I was asking him what separates some of the best teachers in his school. And he did say that being a storyteller and a phenomenal communicator on that level, he said that the knowledge base, most teachers, of course, have the, the knowledge base, but those that can really tell the story and connect it to the lives of the people and the children that, that they are teaching. He was like, that is where the real, um, you know, kind of impact, you know, happens. It sounds like that's a lot of what you guys are doing. But what do you think is next um, for the Concord? When you look over the next two or three years, where are you hoping to take the business and what are you hoping to achieve? Yeah, well, I mean, other, other than the obvious, how do we reach more people? Again, 
try to make our resources free, try to go to conferences and talk about them, get one to tell another about how great we are and, hey, go get these resources. But in terms of the work itself, I mean, everybody's talking about AI. We are no exception. I think I think that the research and the interesting part of that problem there lies in how to engage teachers in telling us what's important about student work. AI machine learning feedback systems are all about how do I take this bunch of stuff and and say, here are the patterns that are common and then look at a new bunch of stuff and say, oh, okay, I can tell this one goes in this bucket and this one goes in that bucket. The trick is what are the buckets, right? Mm -hmm. For a natural language thing like GPT, that's very obvious. It's it's speech, it's natural speech. How do I make more natural speech that looks like other natural speech that I have seen, which is also the danger there because it's only as good as your training set. So we have a similar problem. I can look at a big bag of student work. I've got tons of it stored on our servers. But what's important about the things that the student is doing? I mean, I can make some educated guesses up front, but what I'd really like is for the teachers who really know those students best to be involved in saying, ah, I look at this student A's math homework and I can tell that they're really understanding proportional reasoning. They really know what a fraction is. They really know what a rate of change is. They know what a slope of a line is. This other student I can tell is is failing because they are missing these following pieces of the puzzle. What we need to do is find ways to encode that teacher noticing, it's called, into the software so that the software can help do that too. Because it's one thing for me to tell you, yeah, two plus two is not equal five, but mm -hmm. it's quite another for me to tell you that you don't understand what adding is. Mm -hmm. And here are some exercises, some tools to get you over that hump. So it's actually a much more sophisticated problem than it sounds. I can't just reuse the code. Fine. I can make my algorithms all day, but how do I train them correctly to be of mm -hmm. actual it to the student? And how do I expose those pieces to the students on the other end so that they're actually useful and coaching them at the right time? Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, no, it really does. Because I think, yeah, really being able to understand the, the example, the two plus two example, because I think back to my own child and I, I always had a very good memory. So if someone told me two plus two equals four, I'd remember two plus two plus four. Even though I may not have actually understood the theory of why two plus two equals four, I just remember that someone told me that, and therefore that's that's the answer. Whereas I get, you know, that software of, of really picking apart how people's minds work and making sure that they really, if they are incorrect, what piece are they missing? It must be really, really valuable. And it's going to be really interesting where, yeah, we're able to implement that in schools and learning and, you know, the makeup of classrooms and how we can deal with uh, different personality types and different brains and everything like that. It's going to be amazing over the next few years to see where that goes. Yeah, there's been a real revolution in science teaching. I think in the last 10 years or so, there's a thing called the Next Generation Science Standards, which are starting to be adopted all over the country. Uh, I don't know about outside of the U.S., but it's it's a big deal here, and, and it means that you need to learn to teach differently. It's no longer about memorization. It's no longer about, you know, can I spit back a set of facts to you? It's more about how do I how do I teach myself how to learn? Because that's mm -hmm. what scientists do. And, and so we, we just need to find ways to support that. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. That, that phrase is yeah, it's interesting. How do we teach ourselves how to learn? Like learning how to learn is important. Fantastic. Let's take a little bit of a sidestep here. We've got a few minutes left. One of the topics that we discussed prior to recording the podcast was imposter syndrome. That's something that a few of the guests on our show have talked about, a lot of them being very high-powered, highly successful female executives. Almost every single one of them, or I think actually every single one of them, has said that they did suffer from imposter syndrome at some point in their lives, and it was a barrier they had to overcome. Tell us about your experience with it, and if you would give any advice to anyone that is currently experiencing that. 
Yeah, well, as you just mentioned, I don't, I don't think there's anybody of any mm -hmm. gender or any race or any background who has not at some point felt a little intimidated. I mean, people who are really good at science, like really superstars at this kind of thing are impressive. And you always are going to have that moment of, well, I, I'm not that good. i can't think that fast. I can't have that kind of insight. And it's it's tough to get beyond that. But I think it's particularly tough for women because we come to the table, you know, not wanting to expose any inability. Mm -hmm. We always feel like we have to be better, better than the best, or, yeah, yeah. or we don't mm -hmm. get a seat at the table. I hope that's less true today. I would like to think it's less true, but it was definitely the case when I started 30 years ago in my career. You really had to be on top of your game or you weren't even going to get considered. So, you know, not only are you feeling a little intimidated, you can't really talk to anybody about it. You mustn't expose yourself. So I guess the, the advice that I would give to people of any stripe is be aware, just be self-aware enough to catch yourself at the moment that you're having those not good enough feelings mm -hmm. and find somebody to talk to about it. You have to work your way through it and go, well, I am good enough. And, and here's how I'm going to prove that to myself. And here's how I'm going to learn how to learn what I don't know. Mm -hmm. And here's how I'm going to get beyond this situation. And maybe that's as simple as, you know, finding a peer, somebody who's at your level and saying, hey, can I have an honest evaluation of, of how I'm doing? What could I do better? Or if you're in a position like mine, I ask my employees all the time, what can I do for you? What can I do better? How can I be a better manager? How can I inspire you more? What, what are we missing as a group? And then it's no longer about you. Like then it's no longer about how well did I understand this? How how fast can I write this piece of code? Uh, honestly, mm -hmm. as a CTO, I'm not, I I can I can count one hour a week maybe that I spend on that kind of activity. Mm -hmm. anymore. But you know, it's all about can I understand it? Can I talk about it? Can I be can I be a useful part of the group and contribute mm -hmm. to the overall thing rather than how do I be the star? Because mm -hmm. I think maybe our emphasis is just wrong, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I um, definitely agree with that. And something that I think I learned in over my career was, was that you are far more valuable being a piece of a larger success than being a shining star alone that's just doing their own thing over and over again. And that that is also talking to someone is also a common answer that, that a lot of the people have shared on this podcast. Find yourself a mentor, but almost more important than that. Find yourself a cheerleader, find yourself an advocate. Find yourself as someone, as you said, that can give you a very honest assessment of, you know, am I dropping the ball here or am I a little bit in my own head about my own performance? And knowing that they're going to, not the answer you always want to hear, but they're going to give you an honest assessment of where things are at. Well, that is all the time we have today. But uh, Leslie, thank you so much. I think it's been a really, really great conversation. Coming into your current organization is, is super interesting. Of all of the uh, people we've spoken to on this podcast. I think the company you work for at the moment has such a unique uh, mission and are doing such unique things. It's not like anything I've learned so far. For anyone listening, Leslie's contact information will be on, on the podcast. So I'm sure she won't object if anyone has any questions or wants to reach out. But Leslie, th thank you so much. We really, really appreciate your time. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Excellent. Well, again, thank you guys for listening. I hope you took a lot out of this um, episode. I certainly did. And um, if anyone has uh, questions, please reach out to me and please dial in for our next episode. Thank you so much for listening to today's Her Success podcast brought to you by Ectal. We hope you found this episode instructive, educational, and inspiring. Don't forget to tune in next week.